and welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Grand Lord Crypto. <laughs> and special guest... And I am Noah. There we go. Thanks for having me, guys. We're going to leave a link to Noah's channel down below. You guys got to go check him out. Longtime friend. We've been doing, you know, Tolstoy talks with him and everything. So excited to finally have you on for your first Akutagawa story, I'm being told. That's right. Um, man, I had such fun last year doing a lot of Tolstoy with you guys. It was really cool. And uh, fellow uh, Clarice Lespector fans, Oof. baby. Oh, what Man. what a beautiful mind and 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 beautiful inside and out, right? Yeah. Um really appreciate you inviting me along for this story. What a story. Yeah. So today we're looking at Hell Screen by Ryunosuke Akutagawa, which I think is actually the origin story for Vigo from Ghostbusters 2, if you guys didn't know. <laughs> Definitely could pull off the uh, hellscape, right? <laughs> yeah. Akutagawa, we're, we're huge fans here on the Codex Cantina, and we're diving into him and going further into his repertoire this year. Known for both a heavy Buddhist influence as well as his Christian tales as well that we're going to be kind of getting into over time here. Let's talk about um, Hellscreen here because I think Akutagawa has been a, a very interesting author for us. Father of the short story for Japan. That goes to say something that he's writing in the Taisho period, which is just after Meiji, right? And in crypto here, that's like one of his favorite subjects to teach is the Meiji era, where they cram hundreds of years of industrialization into a matter of, you know, 50, 60 years. Decades. Yeah. So so Japan is just you, you think, oh, okay, we're out of we're out of the storm now. But the Taisho period, when he's writing like this this short time period arguably even more tumultuous as world wars are raging on. Um, this is right before the I novel comes out for Japan. So fables and referencing to a lot of old myths you guys probably saw. There was like four or five myth, like references to right. older lords and stuff like that. That was still popular at the time. And it wasn't until later on that you see that his style gets challenged by the, the reading public, the preference of Japan. So we're still in that era of I would say this feels kind of like a fable almost like how did this story kind of land upon you guys in terms of style well I mean I definitely uh I definitely see that when it when it comes down to kind of looking at it through a Buddhist lens it it is it I was looking at it and feel these kind of things that he's bringing out of what kind of beings are these characters that we're dealing with mm. and what are they dealing for themselves going forward Okay. Because, you know, in a Buddhist way, you're always looking at that cyclic existence. And and uh, if you're not going to, you know, attain a high level of enlightenment in this lifetime, well, you at least want to do good for yourself. Um, and and there's there's a there's some serious stuff in this short story. <laughs> awesome. And, and if you didn't know, I didn't even mention that's why we have Noah on board. My background in Buddhism is very limited. I took one class on it in college. And, and Noah has a much more extensive and even a video series. I can leave a link to his playlist down below where he's exploring, you know, what Buddhism has meant to him in his life and such. Uh, crypto? This would definitely hit me more the uh, historical aspect, as you said, where this is being published, 1918, right at the end of World War One. Heavy, super push towards industrialization for for Japan. You can really feel the shift of old to modern in this story and i feel like it's trying to hang on to that idea of mysticism from the old but also putting it in a modern state of 1918 20th century in, in incredible how he just paints this vivid picture uh you know no pun intended for the the hellscape the hell screen that that is presented um i i really felt that this this piece shows his greatness and how he took these ideas of Japan and its struggle with itself to identify what was going to be important to it as its identity moving forward. And I think he encapsulates that perfectly. All right, let's get into this. So I'm going to do a quick plot recap, make sure everybody is on the same page for what happened in the story. And then we're just going to get into this discussion. Let's, let's see what trouble we get into today, gents. So, <laughs> so the plot opens with the narrator kind of exalting the great lord Horigawa. 
And we hear the story about how the Lord commissioned a compelling depiction of hell uh, to be painted by the renowned painter Yoshihide. The narrator tells us the backstory, how Yoshihide was mean and self-centered, putting his art before everything else in his life, except for his daughter, with whom he's had a special connection. They were close, and their love for each other was strong, and he'd even hire thugs to protect her from unwanted advances from men, which is why he was very disheartened when one day she became under a position of his lordship, and she became the favored lady of the manor. While the narrator claims to us that the Lord only admired her for her filial devotion, Yoshihide was sure he was after her for her beauty. Meanwhile, Yoshihide does an amazing job painting things such as Buddhist depictions of Monju for the Lord. And as a reward, Lord is just like, okay, man, whatever you want, you name it, it's yours. I'm so impressed with your painting. And he's like, okay, well, um, can you release my daughter? <laughs> How brazen of you out. Not, not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the daughter starts to fear for her father's life as apparently there's been four or five incidents where something similar has happened. Now, eventually, Yoshihide is commissioned to paint the hell screen for the Lord, depicting the eight circles of hell, which Mr. Mr. Noah here is going to have to explain to me. The process <laughs> Yoshihide performs is grotesque. He can't paint what he hasn't seen. So he'll have birds just peck at his, you know, his, his assistants and chain them up and cause torture and bodily harm to them so that he can capture their grotesque responses to their situations. And this all leads up to a day when the narrator one sees um, Yuzuki run by and she has this look of fear, this look of he saw something he shouldn't have as she runs away. So then we're getting closer to the finishing of the hell screen. And Yoshihide says, all right, Lordship, I need one more thing. Can you set a carriage on fire so I can paint it? And you know what? Hey, um, can you throw a live woman into that fire while I do it? You know, just burn her alive. <laughs> totally normal request. And the Lord's like, uh, let, let me check into this. So they go to this, you know, place a little bit further away, this garden. And he sets it up and... Lo and behold, inside the carriage is a maiden, and that maiden just so happens to be Yuzuki, his daughter. Boom. So he sees his daughter burn alive before his eyes, and what's he do? He's he's okay with it. He's aghast. He's aghast, and then it turns into ecstasy. I believe was the words in my my translation, and he finishes his painting of the hell screen with his daughter being burned alive. The day after, he commits suicide. And people stop talking bad about Yoshihide after that. That's that's the plot at a high level. I realize I dropped a few things like the monkey and stuff like that, but I figure we'll get into that with these talking points here today. Sure. So I guess the first thing that kind of th this story made me question, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this, is what makes a person a good person? And they've got some references here to the five virtues, uh, a sure. Buddhist idea where they say, excel in his art though he might. If a man does not know the five virtues, he can only end up in hell. Noah, can you can you kick us off with kind of talking about like what did, what does that line mean to you? Because the five virtues might not be a common thing, I think, for maybe perhaps some Western audiences. Well, it's not. I, I understand it's not a common thing for Westerners for sure, but it's Confucianism, not Buddhism. Oh, okay. That okay. is that is from uh, Confucianism, and you know this kind of focusing on virtue how how it relates into the way what i could see is that you're going to focus on or you're going to do stuff oh that's karma action you're gonna do things in life and you have to to live you have to keep doing um what matters is whether those actions are skillful or, or unskillful so virtuous action is always skillful, whereas vice, going towards vice and things like that is always unskillful. So Confucianism was so much more um, looking at and, and, and placing so much value on the family unit and loyalty and things like that to others. It was a very social uh, belief set. And it's, it's beautiful like that. And it just holds true. 
that if you're not if you're not uh, focusing on virtue, then you're falling into vice. You there is no kind of sitting still in that. Okay. Your your actions have consequences. Okay. One of the things that my translation had at the bottom when it was describing this, and I'm curious if, if this is true for what you're looking at, it says the five things, the five precepts are one, don't harm living beings. Two, Three. don't take from or violate others. Three, no sexual misconduct. Four, right. no false speech. And five, no intoxicating drinks or, or drugs. And that kind of felt like, I wonder, that felt kind of like a main theme to me, right? Those uh, five precepts are Buddhist. Those are uh, very, those are uh, Pali canon. So like first, uh, it is ter like Theravada, very, very first uh, century Buddhist teachings, not uh, Mahayana, which is what spread through Asia and oh. China and Japanese. And now they, they don't, they don't discredit that. Of course, that is of a, a more fundamental tenant, but that's the only five kind of precepts that were put out there by the Buddha himself for lay practitioners that you uh, hold to those in that way. If you do that, then you don't fall back. You'll always progress. So, yeah. I had a question because I was thinking about this, um, and, and if you don't know a lot about it, um, maybe you won't be able to answer the question, but during this time period as we enter into this rebirth of what is Asia going to be like, specifically China, we move through the Song and the Tang dynasties, and you see this push of Buddhism against legalism of how are we going to live our lives and specifically China trying to find its identity. Did you feel in this story that you had a little bit of that, of Yoshido being the, ide the ideal of the five virtues versus the Lord, who is kind of the legalism idea of we're going to be ruled by this, mm. this almost authoritarian regime, and they're almost kind of combating each other, right? And in the end, the mm. Lord wins because he kills his daughter, and he still gets the painting that he wants of hell. You know, this is an amalgamation of of buddhist ideas and confucian confucianism it is it is something like that where they're in this time period and 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 it probably lasted hundreds and hundreds of years over the mainland asia you know china these areas and also japan too because the priest that is in here calls out amitabha which okay. is pure land buddhism a totally different style of Buddhism where um, they actually chant and, and call on a, a, a Buddha Bodhisattva as a deity to bring them after their life, this one life to a pure land. It's called pure land Buddhism. And so it's a whole different type of Buddhism than anything we've talked about so far. And, but all of it is present in this story. So it is, it is, I think it, it shows very well, not just in spirit modes of spirituality, but also the social constructs as well, how things are, are just complex. And there's a lot at play yeah. here. I, you know, even, even on the social front, there's a, there's a lot that I saw. That's crazy. And just 30 pages, right? I mean, 30 pages and he's, yeah. he's, he's thrown at us. Thousands of years of Confucianism, legalism, Buddhism, and he's probably sprinkling in a little other things that we missed of, you know, can, uh, Shintoism, right? I mean, because well, yeah. if, if yeah. I may point, if I may point out some of those, because <laughs> that would be my area, <laughs> right? So, so there do. are some very old tales that um, were written. It's kind of like Japan's Canterbury Tales that he's made several references to. You heard them talk in the very beginning when they're exalting the Lord. And they're like, oh, he went to this corner where there's all these goblins. And that's a, a reference to very specific tales, along with Monju, who is the Japanese equivalent of a specific Buddha in, in, in Buddhism. But sure. um, there's some references to like that. And even they start talking, you'll notice there's like three or four references to plum blossoms and stuff like that, which was like the predecessor to the cherry blossoms. And those ah. were kind of references to ward off evil spirits. 
and you always put them in a specific corner of the garden to kind of warn off the evil because in Shintoism, your evil wasn't necessarily, it's more compatible with Buddhism, but it's evil infects you and you have to cleanse yourself of that evil in, in, right. in Shintoism. And you could see a little bit of that too, where like how these people were infected by some evil. And I couldn't help but wonder how you guys maybe took that with the monkey. You know, you guys. Is that where I want to? I want to ask one question real quick. Is yeah, that yeah. where the kind of the, it's it's like a demon that they reference in 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 reference to the artist that he's an arrogant person and a demon of arrogance. He's he's likened to that. Is that demon coming from Shinto? Do you remember that reference? I don't remember that reference. I'd have to go look that one up to know for sure. Um, but even okay. then, I'm not like a scholar on Shintoism. I'm just sure. you know, a passive fr you know, <laughs> sure. friend of it. Um, I'm curious, how did you guys take the monkey in this one, be as we're talking about this? Because the monkey right. that they got was named after the painter, Yoshihide. Right. He was an outcast as well at first, right? And they had that mm -hmm. line where they're like, well, the monkey doesn't know any better. And the daughter took the monkey in, started protecting it. It started following her around mm -hmm. when she was attacked. If you remember, it bowed to the narrator. After, you know, right. he kind of was like, oh, go on your way and stuff like that. How did you guys interpret the monkey in the context of things? When it when it comes down to the monkey, I an animal is is the level of being in in Buddhist cosmology that's right underneath human beings. And what the in in the first painting or the uh, artwork that he did on the gate that is depicting the different levels of being or the life cycle the wheel of life right the animal part portion of that there's a buddha traditionally in all, every single area of being and the buddha does certain things different things for different beings what the buddha gives to animals which is what we do for animals if we want to help them to progress is we give them culture we talk to them, we treat them like part of the family, we bring them in the family. We, and they actually on most, a lot of the depictions, uh, visual depictions of this, has the animal, a dog, more, more than ever is a dog, but sh uh, with a book in front of it. Not that the dog is reading a book, but just to symbolize that you're giving the, the dog culture. Mm. And the main thing, what we do, every single pet, is going to progress and why is because what we do the most va valuable thing that we do for animals is we allow them to live a life without killing because they are kill or be killed they are in a whole different type of world than we are by their by their place being an animal and by us being able to give them a life where they don't have to kill and where they don't have to worry about being killed we're lessening their fear uh all that kind of thing just the morality of not killing they will uh in in a buddhist cosmology be uh rebirth as a human afterwards and that goes into what you're talking about earlier with as a human you have these choices that you can make and it says you're right. a human you're trying to progress i think further and, right and see with an animal they're they're acting out of instinct so mm -hmm. we make the choices for them Mm -hmm. And so our choices are to help them. So this animal, I looked, uh, this monkey is symbolic. And it's symbolic of the one he is named after, right? The artist, for sure. So I saw this animal as doing everything that the artist wished he could do without with that that he wasn't able to actually do because of his his stature, his place in life. He had to remain, uh, he had to finish his commission. He had to finish his commission. This is the Lord, the emperor, whatever he is, but an authority figure that he is under. He is, you know, and he is who he is. And um, so, and, and we see time and time again, the anthropomorphizing of this uh, monkey, uh -huh. Uh -huh. where he's bowing, where he is, uh, you know, showing emotion, mm -hmm. emotional states. Mm -hmm. So it is, It I think, very uh, strongly is showing what animals are in reference to humans, which is our, our unchecked emotions. That's how we can see what they are in reference to us. But 
um, also that this monkey is by virtue of uh, being a a pet and being loved and cared for by human beings, that this is one that is moving higher, that is progressing. And everybody wants to progress, even if that it's not conscious and whatever, but you know, they want we want to progress. We don't want to fall back. Falling back is bad. It's hellish. It's, you know, negative. Yeah. So um we see that happening. And we kind of see that like it almost feels like they're kind of would you say they're mirrors almost of each other where Yoshihide maybe is being pulled back. What's he being pulled back by? Would we call it greed? Would we call it worldly yeah. attachment yeah. to his uh, his art? You know, he's obviously stuck in worldly desires and passions. And, right. I, and I think that's what pulls him down while the monkey we see might be elevated a little bit by the the choices that you know, people are making and we see that, see that it's kind of happening with him. The monkey can be very easily elevated because it's lower. You see what I'm saying? Like there's all these different ways that I've like what I've said there and more uh, ways that it can be elevated because it is lower for the human to be a progress higher. It's going to take self-sacrifice in in big ways and he is not willing to do that kind of thing he's not willing to buck the system the system being the lord and what uh this whole system of what he's in well i think that's what you get into where you talked about earlier of there's these social classes in here as well and of course that's always going to be a theme um that agutagawa has in his stories and his books right is he is benefited by his greed he's benefited he is the greatest artist in the land, you know, according to himself. Yeah, he he loves his status. Exactly. And I think that we see the monkey embodied everything that he should be if he was a true good Buddhist, and he's not. And he is the antithesis of what you shouldn't do. And he pays for it in the end with his daughter's life and his own life. Right. I don't see any real practitioners in this story you see what i mean like Mm -hmm. i don't see any real practitioners in this story at all right um they're all kind of going with the flow of their life uh dealing with the things that come up in their experience right and and they're all very well off all of these human beings uh and the monkey you know i mean they're all all of our characters are very very well off i mean they're the the highest level of society it brings up that question a question that i had that i've that i just kind of kicked around a bunch is why and and it's telling this guy is a really good storyteller mm-hmm. um yeah. so yeah. He's, why, he's decent <laughs> why did uh this why did he not embrace letting his daughter in you know go into mm-hmm. the court of this lord there's no higher station she could aspire to so why not take pride in that and say, yes, you know, you've you've kind of made it based on our status and, and what we can achieve. Here, here you go. You know, uh, let's find you a, a suitable uh, suitor. You know what I mean? But but there's there's something that it that that's what makes you get to a place where you're like, OK, there's something going on here. That's subtext. Mm-hmm. There's something going on here underneath the surface of this story. Mm-hmm. And it has to do with the narrator, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah, this this narrator is an engine for the story, right? right. F- from the very beginning, the way we view each other. And, and I think that's one of Akutagawa's gifts is his deep insight to human nature. And we see how he exalts the Lord Horikawa in the beginning. He right. can do no wrong. Well, he sacrificed a little boy because a bridge was being built too it was, slow. It was, that was said as a virtue. <laughs> He totally downplays it, right? It's 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 a it's a horrific thing, but then when Yoshihide does some terrible things, like the owl being you know unleashed on his assistants and stuff, the narrator's like, "What a jerk!" Right? Like, yeah. like he lets things slide for Horikawa because he's in his employ, right? Mm. And yeah. he bashes Yoshihide. Because everybody <laughs> else does. Let's all jump on that train of it's easy to pick on this guy because everyone else. You hit the nail on him. the head, Una. Yeah. 
All right, I got one, <laughs> one point. All right, there we go. All right. Thanks for you joining in. You hit the nail on the head, Una. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> I said, uh, uh, you know, it's this thing where at the beginning, even this guy, I was like, I was like, these virtues that you're extolling about the Lord are not virtues. What is happening here? And then um, when when the artist is totally single minded, focused on on doing this commission that the Lord has given him to do. He's he's slamming him for it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, why are you slamming him? He's doing this for the one you are professing your love about talking to the narrator there you know it's like what are you doing why is there this dichotomy going on where there is there is something going on here there's something wrong here well the the structure... well, he's challenging his status he's challenging his you know attention and old yoshi he's you know the center of it all and he is the one that is going to provide something to the lord that the narrator can't and I mean, it's very obvious from the beginning that the narrator is biased and untrustworthy. I feel like because he just flip flops so often. Yeah, through the, through the whole story, he flip flops back and forth, and he won't give us the information we need. And I think that Akutagawa does that on purpose. Of what is this relationship? Because he keeps saying, "Oh, it's not inappropriate. It's not inappropriate." But I feel like right, that he's always all the rela- excuses. Yeah, all the relationships are almost inappropriate in this story. And that's one of the key things of Buddhism, right, are that if you have these virtues, you have these very strong relationships with people. And all the relationships in this entire story are broken. They're all broken on purpose, on purpose. And it's genius writing. Mm -hmm. It is really good. It's really, really good. And it's that thing where I I, I see exactly what you're saying with he's he's uh, (laughs) he's just digging. He, he's he's got it almost seems like a personal vendetta hmm. that the narrator has a personal problem with the artist and you know it, it makes sense to extol the virtues of the leader the lord and there's there's this kind of thing where you just you fall in line with that in the culture that we're in like that, you know, you just fall in line with that. If not, then you do, you know, you dishonor yourself and he'll order you to do a ritualistic suicide. Or he'll, you know what I mean? Or he'll put you, or he'll put you in a carriage and burn you alive. Right. Well, because could it, could it be fear? It could be honor. It it could be dedication, but it could be fear too. Both like that. It, It is like that. And I mean, there's a lot of fear of fear based control and and things that I've come in contact with in uh, Japanese culture, ex, you know, talking about um, the 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 social structure and the hierarchical social structure. It's like you know, the 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 head of household, which is the male, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, traditionally, the head of household could actually like just kill his whole family if he felt like it. And say they were they were wrong, they were bad, you know what I mean? Some things like that. Uh, the Lord could look at people that are dealing, you know, are under him, which everybody is, and just say, you know, you've you've dishonored yourself, commit seppuku right now. In and they, the, they, in, they the hay, in the hay, to, in the hay in period, you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean that that kind of that kind of um social structure the the kind of understanding of what you owe your your authority mm. you know kind of moves through culture I and so that kind of thing okay in the part where he says if it's possible to the emperor or the to the lord and 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 he and he laughs at him and he says don't worry about what's possible just tell me what you want, you know, and I'll do it. Right. Okay. There is there is a time period like in uh have has anybody here come in contact with Shogun by James Clavell? Have oh, you have no, you read, read it? it? No. It's a, it's a it's a great um historical fiction of Japan. But that kind of thing, just saying like, is it possible to a to uh your your leader, your lord, your emperor? whatever it is that that is uh, running your your social because there was 
you know, Japan was sectioned off. It wasn't all always, uh, you know, ran by one, one, one person or something like that. When the Shogun were in power. Yeah. Well, I know that. Right, right, right. It's, it's, it's before yeah. Shogun, you know, right. Or, or in, well, in, go ahead. Well, I know that this story isn't autobiographical. He does write a short story that is autobiographical. And this is, uh, what, 13, 18 years, I think, before his, uh, his death, Agutagawa. And I think that there are, I, I think this was his first draft. And it may be in, an, or he threw elements of, you know, his biography in here. Because you talk about seppuku and you, you talk about, you know, the the untrustworthy of the narrator and all the characters in the story, I feel like they all kind of emulate a little bit of his life and that the artist would be willing to go through anything, sacrifice anything, including his own life and his own family mm -hmm. for the detriment or the betterment of his craft. And Akutagawa does that himself, committing suicide. Um, and in basically, uh, Yoshide has done the same thing, right? He, he's virtually committed suicide and then does commit suicide uh with with completing this commission and um i think that's a very common thing uh that we see kind of in the history of japan that they're willing to do anything for your art there is no stigma about uh suicide in in that kind of culture it is almost like if you if you've done dishonor and you you know deserve it then do it. You know, it's it's like you have to take that's how you take responsibility for what you've done or something. It's crazy. And, and that well, it's not. Yeah, to us, because it's not crazy, because it brings it back to your idea of that. This is not a Christian piece because hell for them is based on something entirely different where purgatory is basically worse than hell. Right. If I understand Buddhism as, as, as my limited capacity. Well, I mean, it, it would say we say purgatory is worse than hell. I mean, that's comparing two different belief sets and two different cultures. It doesn't really like kind of compute. It doesn't really work. But I would say, I mean, hell okay. is infinitely worse because how it's set up in the belief set, if you're going to go for it, which I don't, you know, and I don't think anybody really can without going insane, is that that's an eternity of that's an end stop, right? Okay. Yeah. You stop that's in it. hell. That's <laughs> it. Well, I thought in Buddhism it was an eternity. It, in Buddhism, it's not eternity. So when they're talking right. about hell, they're not, they're talking about a place, a realm, but they're not talking about a time period. Eternal suffering, right? Right. They're not talking they're, about eternity because or, you're yeah. going to go – like if you go to a hell realm because you are such a bad person – then you're going to go there and you're going to suffer. And yes, maybe it might be thousands of years. It might be so long that you go and your mind is obliterated by all the torment. But you will at some point get another Come chance. <laughs> get another right. chance. Yeah. yeah. Next well, next well that's that's a key to the understanding of the story, right? I mean, we, we've analyzed a lot of topics here, but if you read this with a Western view – it's going to be a, you're going to get a lot different. I understand. Well, why would he do this? Why would he sacrifice these things? What does hell mean to this culture compared to my culture? And I think there's a lot to be, a lot to learn there. Have and, to. uh, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad we had you on because it, it, it opens up a lot of those, uh, answers. So thank you. Well, all right, guys, I think we could probably talk for another half an hour on this. What do you think? But let's wrap it up for right now. Final thoughts and ratings on this story. Let's start with the guest. Noah, what you going to give this one? Uh, thank you, Una. Man, this is this was a really cool story. Um, I will I will say a little bit of it I kind of saw coming, but it's all about how it worked out and the the characters having their own kind of. I mean, even the narrator becomes one of these characters that you're maybe most interested in. It was really really good writing, and so. I, I don't usually do ratings on mine, but as far as out of 10, um, I'll give it a seven and a half. There you <laughs> I'll go. Get a, I'll give it a seven. There you go. And then I'll round it up if you guys are higher than mine. <laughs> Crypto? Um, yeah, this piece for 30 some pages in the one that I read, um, you know, smushed together the two serialized 
pieces from newspapers. I, I don't know how truly long it was, but it, it didn't feel very long at all to have so many different topics crammed in there, to have so much history, to have so much religion, so much depth and thought. There are things that we didn't talk about, like the psychology of of this, the obsession, the OCD of it, what the lengths you're going to to complete some artistic goal of yours. There's just, there's so much to unpack. And I just am always amazed by how much Agutagawa can cram into such a short story and how much he can make me feel. And that's crazy. And I did not see the writing on the wall. I was completely oblivious when they pulled the wool from over my eyes and was like, oh yeah, the daughter is the one in the ox cart. I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> okay. And I, I had to rethink the whole story then because that is, that, that, I mean, you talk about peaks and valleys. That is a peak. I mean, that, that, the story is amazing without that, but that just elevates it, I think, to that. For me, it's like that magical nine, 9.5, because uh, it really does it take it to the next level for me. So again, it, this is nearly a perfect story. I was just, uh, the footnotes, you have to be okay with reading a few dozen footnotes, I feel like, and that always detracts from me when I have to be pulled out of the story to check the footnotes, because I'm a sucker for the history of it all, and they were putting some real historical stuff in there, and that that irked me a little tiny bit, but not not enough to say this is not something you shouldn't read. Read this one. Highly recommend. Yeah, this was definitely sure. this was definitely higher on the illusion per word count reference. You know, uh, definitely still not as high as Ulysses will <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> but it it is definitely higher up there. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I saw it coming too. But also, I mean, in a story where there's two guys and a girl, and they're like, "Hey, we need to sacrifice a girl," and this girl's been rather insignificant through the whole plot. You're like, "Yeah." <laughs> this could this could be where he's going. Yep, that's where he went. <laughs> but I don't know if that um I don't know if that matters for me because this felt more like a fable. It should be relatable. It should be something that can appeal to an, an older audience looking to have an hour long discussion on it, or, or to yeah. a younger audience that's looking to get their feet wet and kind of understand more. I think that's kind of the be the beauty of Akutagawa is that he can take human beings and make them relate to us as readers so definitely a magical story i will go 8.5 for this one which is a random rating so are, are you rounding up no are we going to eight? i'm rounding up then. we're going to eight okay you guys rock i'll give it an eight and, and i tell you i mean there's there's so much that like crypto said there that we didn't talk about about this i mean how about when the monkey comes and gets the girl or gets the narrator who we don't know what his position is gets the narrator and and there is somebody, you know, messing with the daughter of the artist in there. Mm -hmm. And who is that? Who was that? And 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 these kind of questions and it was probably Lord what, Horikawa. <laughs> yeah, it was. But you know, <laughs> the the it it just adds so much to the depth of me. like what's happening. You're in immersed in the in the court of this. What it. What if, I just had a thought, you, you inspired me, what if the narrator is the Lord's son? Right. That would fit very well. It would, because Nar he shows up, and then he's never talked about again. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's so weird. Mm. I, I, I've been thinking, I'm like, who is this narrator? Yeah. Yeah. What is Ooh. his position? He's there. He's there at the end. He's there for, he's there at the court for every meeting with this artist when he's saying oh he doesn't he doesn't open his court for a meeting for you know just <laughs> randomly but he did for this guy well you're there you know the narrator's there so who is this guy yeah yeah and we didn't even talk about the so monkey much. and we need great. and we didn't even it's talk great. about the monkey being in the fire at the end and what does that mean for yoshihide well as... that's that's the monkey doing a, the highest level kind of human thing, a self-sacrifice. Yeah. And, and well, or something and, that he loves and then something that the father should have done. Well, and he knew was coming. Cause remember in his dream, remember he saw his daughter he saying, knew it. come to hell for me. Yep. And, and what does he do? He paints it. Right. So much to the story. Very, very strong uh, story. Good story. It's wild. All right, guys, thank you for tuning in. We post videos every Monday and Thursday. If you'd like to check out some more uh, Akutagawa, make sure you hit that subscribe button because we're going to be back on here talking more about him because he's amazing, and we're going to keep talking about him until you guys read him. Read so, him. Peace. <laughs> thank you, guys. Crypto out.